So today we're going to talk about platform and business models. In other words, how platforms make money. So why should you care about this? Let's begin. So it is clear to everybody that companies like uh, Amazon, or Uber, Airbnb are very successful companies. But what is not clear to everybody is that these companies, together with those businesses here, are platform companies. It's not clear to everybody what a platform business model is and why it's so powerful. Now, McKinsey demonstrates that 30% of all economic activities, which is $60 trillion, will be mediated by platform in the next 10 years. And yet, only 2% of companies are having an active platform strategy today. So why does that happen? What is holding them back? First, a little bit of definition. I think it's actually useful to start by saying what a platform is not. So a platform is not just a piece of technology. People typically confuse a platform with a, a suite of software programs or an API. Rather, a platform is a business model. It's a business model that brings together buyers and sellers in an ecosystem helping them to transact and exchange value with the aim of capturing part of that value. Right? In other words, the platform enable people to get what they need from each other. That's my own definition. It's about efficiency, increasing efficiency. So why platforms are so powerful? Because of these three things that I hope you can read them down here. So I will explain them to you with the example of Airbnb. So Airbnb is asset like. Airbnb does not own any buildings, any hotels. Airbnb has nearly zero marginal cost, so Airbnb relies on external labor and other resources, and network effects. So Airbnb relies on, uh, on network effect, which means the more guests sign up to the platform, the more hosts sign up, and, uh, and so on. So these three things are exemplified in this famous tweet from the CEO of Airbnb that said that many of us will have 30,000 rooms this year. Fair enough, he said. We're going to do the same in two weeks. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to be using a fictional example of a gym that wants to reinvent itself and reshape its value chain as a platform with independent fitness trainers and then gym users. Okay? And these examples can be applicable also to any professional service marketplace, really, mostly in the business to consumer space. Why am I using this example? Because I want to make clear that nowadays, even your gym, even your local fitness center, makes much of its money not by what it sells, but by facilitating interactions of others. Just like uh, uh, farmers markets or stock exchange already do. So, in reality, everybody could create a platform and have a chance to succeed. So the pie is big enough for everyone to, to profit. Now, let's have a look at some of the way the gym, using our example, are experimenting with, uh, with platform business models. So this is the linear model. It's a pipeline model. It's a model which is based on subcontracting. Here, our gym is an intermediary. What it does, it hires independent fitness trainers and rents them out to the gym user at, at employee costs, adding overhead on top of it. Now, the gym user is not in direct contact with the trainer in the negotiation of the engagement. Sometimes the gym user does not even know that the fitness trainer is an independent contractor rather than an employee of the gym. Now, this model is fine. You can monetize with it, all right? But it bears one problem, which is called bypassing what I indicate here on top, also called, in platform jargon, is called platform leakage. That means that the gym user at some point will bypass the platform, its payment system, and, and so on, and make arrangements directly with the trainer. If that happens, the gym becomes redundant. So who's doing this? Who's using this business model? One example, Boeing, the aircraft manufacturer, is working with as many as 13,000 independent engineers which are building the smallest pieces of an aircraft. What Boeing does is sells everything to Finnair 
The female has to deal only with Boeing and not with the independent contractors. So from practice. Another example is the oil and gas industry, very typical. They also work with an army of, uh, of independent contractors. Now let's move on again with our example of the gym in another model, another business model of platforms. This is what I call the transitional model, which is a model, it's a sort of hybrid model where companies are beginning to dip their toes into the platform economy risk-free. Okay? So what's, what's important, what's, what's the feature of this model is that you see the gym gets out of the way and the users and the trainers are in more direct contact, negotiating engagement, setting conditions with each other, etc., etc. So this model is no longer based on the fixed cost by the gym, but it's based on variable cost set by the independent fitness trainer. So what the gym does, very simple, it charges a fee to the gym user for the matching. So not, nothing more than that, really. So it does not facilitate a payment system. It, it, it is no algorithm matching and all those things. It's manual kind of work. It's like a hotel, you know, like a concierge in a hotel. You know, it's a helpful kind of thing. It's a facilitator, right? Um, and it also not allowing the trainers to bid or anything. Just a service fee for the matching. Who's doing this in Finland? Let's look at Finland. This is very typical with those platforms that aggregate a lot of listing on the on, on, on their platform. Tima is a platform for hairdressers. So if you don't know which hairdresser to go, it puts them all together for you. You choose Tima as a platform, charges a fee for you to, to find the right hairdresser for you. Another example, again from Finland, Jennifer. Genify is a platform to find members of your band, exchange instruments, and make music together. It's an example of a hybrid model where the platform takes a little fee for the matching. Okay? So now things are becoming a bit serious here. This is the business model of Uber. Okay? So in this model, you see that the gym users and the trainer are in a total direct contact with each other before the project starts. So the users set their own price, names the project, and then uh, uh, the trainers are bidding, you know, with their own rates to fulfill that project. Here the platform does not know, the, the gym is an enabler, does not own any inventory, but owns the platform itself. So it sets rules when it, and conditions when it comes to logistics, pricing, governance, openness, and so on. So what happens in this model is that the gym takes money from the user, all right, charges the user, takes money from the user, keeps it in something which we call escrow, and then releases the money to the trainer once the job is done, holding a commission fee, all right, between 5 and 20%. Who's using this model in Finland? For example, Bloxcart. You can rent your car from the neighbors. Bloxcart as a platform takes a service fee for, from the ones that is renting the car. You're living on holiday, you don't know to whom uh, you could leave your cat or your pet, uh, but fear not because you have something called Host My Pet here in Finland which takes care of finding a carer for your, for your pet. Again, the platform is charging uh, the supply side a percent as a commission. Now, I apologize, that this looks really, really cramped from far, I hope you can see, but it's in fact very, very simple because it's exactly the same model as before with only one slight and very important difference that more entities participate in this ecosystem. So the platform becomes the orchestrator because it deals with many more entities. This is the multi-sided mode. These more entities are the gym, what I call the gym equipment suppliers. This one's on top. What they do, they lend their equipment to the trainer and they receive the money from the gym, from the commission, uh, minus the commission he has raised. Okay. Examples in Finland of this multi-sided mode 
is probably the most classic example you can find. Courier services, riders, something like Deliveroo, Fudora, or Bolt. Let's go back, actually. So, on Bolt, you have the guy that orders a pizza, then you have the rider, the, the courier, but then you have the restaurants on top. So the platform takes the money from the, from the guy that orders the pizza and releases the money to both uh, the rider and uh, the restaurant. And this is also the business model of the Apple iOS system because you have the consumer of digital content, uh, the, the one that is selling an ebook, all right? But then you have those ones, the developers here on top, which are adding value to the ebook. They produce ebook readers, it's all the programs that you need in order to, to read an ebook. And here is Apple. So, Vault. Another example in Finland, anyone getting married here? If, if so, then you can look at Hattori, I hope I pronounce it well. It started with a, with a two-sided mode, actually. It started by being uh, only a platform that connects uh, um, wedding planners and, and people that need a wedding planner. But actually, what they found out is that there are so many others that participate in an ecosystem. It's a very complex project to get married. So you need a photographer, you need a caterer, you need someone to put flowers in the church, you need someone to make the dress for the bride. And all these people act on top of the ecosystem value to it. Now the last business model that I'm going to show you, and this is the fourth, is the business model of Netflix. This is the advanced model. Why advanced? Because in this, this model only works when the number of fitness trainers, we go back to the example of the gym, when the number of fitness trainers on the platform increases. So there are really, really many. So what the platform does, again the enabler, the gym, is charging a subscription or membership fee to the user uh, per month or per year based on the number of services required, how many fitness trainers you need, the specific services, etc. The basic plan is free. It's called the freemium model, which combines very well with the subscription. So uh, who's, who's using the freemium, think about LinkedIn, uh, think about Tinder. <coughs> Uh, there are all platforms that use the basic services for free, but then when you get your users hooked up, uh, they start charging. What, why is this different than the one before of Uber? Is that here the gym is charging the demand side. So the gym is charging the user this uh, subscription fee and then releases the money to the trainer without commission. This is the important thing. Before, it was the trainer that was charged in the two-sided mode. Again, examples from Finland. Work Pilots is a labor market aggregator. Say that you need uh, uh, three people to clean your apartment uh, per month or one babysitter uh, once a week. So you get on a subscription plan and the Work Pilot finds these people for you. Another example is Opia. Opia is a platform for training. Uh, so you can get, you can jump on a subscription plan and uh, you can participate to as many trainings as you want which are all listed on the Opia platform. Now of course there are many other uh, platform business models. What's important is that you first start with one but then you can move to others or you can even combine different ones which is what Upwork is doing. So let's go quickly, very very quickly on different other business models eh? without many examples and so on. But so the business model of eBay, um, the business model of eBay is different from the ones before because it's called the listing fee. So you have uh, many, many listings on, uh, on a website. You're selling many products or services. And then the platform is charging you a fee to get them featured, so to be on top of others. Who's doing this in Finland? Tori, of course. You pay five euros and then it puts your, your listing up for the next week or so. That is the lead fee, which is typical of the auction sites. Um, so what happens here is that the customer posts a request, again a product or a service, and then the supply, the provider, makes a bid, like in an, in an auction, to, um, uh, sorry, pays a fee in order to bid for that specific customer. One example is OnLike, which is a platform for real estate in the US. 
in Finland, Uto, of course, it allows you to participate into auctions and make these uh, uh, leads. Then you have the white label, you have a great platform, and uh, you have a great marketplace, and then you decide to just sell it to others as a white label, as a platform, for others to customize. Um, who's using this in Finland is a Solv, which is a platform for clean tech um, freelancers. So they started with a clean tech freelancer platform. They say, wow, everyone else can use this platform for every freelance kind of activity. Let's sell it as a white label. That's how it's one of their business models, how they make money. Then what is typical with the second-hand clothes is, um, is resale. So you buy cheap and you sell expensive. It's very, very simple. Uh, usually it's second-hand clothes. Um, or, as an example here in Finland, you have Rescue, which is, which is great actually. I'm using it almost every day. But it's a platform for um, uh, unused uh, surplus food from restaurants or cafe or supermarkets. Um, they use that business model. Then, of course, it's the business model of mechanical, me Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is the, the, um, uh, the micro-tasking, and then selling them as a bundle. Uh, I have to say that I have problems to find an example from Finland about micro-work. Maybe it does not even exist, you tell me. But what I find uh, is these initiatives which are common, and I think Iceland was the first, uh, where you crowdsource the constitution and you ask uh, people to, yeah, to tell you as the government <laughs> what you should put in the constitution. Finland has the same uh, uh, experiment. Then we get into something a little bit more complicated, but uh, bear with me. Um, the pocket base is the, is the blockchain-enabled uh, platform where you don't really have transaction fees. You have the miners doing their work, and through the proof of work and proof of concept, uh, that's how they get paid, all right? So the platform is not centralized, it's not bringing all many revenues. In Finland, the only example I was able to find was something up here there, I don't know if it's not in it's a uh, paper block, which is a it's platform for blockchain engineers. Is there a way to get this away? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what does it say? Sorry, it will switch off. All right, I'm gonna be quick. Uh, I really hope it doesn't though, because I might have been a Sorry, anyway. The last business model I wanted to show you is the platform cooperative. It's, it's really important and it's an emerging movement where the value of the platform is, not, is, no, longer, uh, is no longer transferred to the venture capitalist or to the CEO of the platform or to the Silicon Valley, but it stays local with the users, with the workers, with the ones benefiting from the platform the most. And uh, that's... I still have five minutes. So. Yes, yes. Okay, that's good. At least you have one. You have two eyes, you have one. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, so who's doing this in Finland? Uh, Lilith. Lilith is a, is a worker cooperative, but they call themselves a platform because actually they give a lot of value to their uh, self-employed workers uh, through many services which they have aggregated into a platform. Now, Oh, came back. So, the, um, the, the, uh, what are the common denominators of what I just showed you? Um, I think you can read some of these things, but what I wanted to tell you is that one of the common denominators is decentralization. You need to let go. You cannot control any, everything with platforms, okay? You need to let go production to third parties. Second is solving the chicken and egg. That's really important. So that means building supply and demand simultaneously. And that often means subsidizing one of the two sides of the platform, either supply or demand. Usually it's different. If you have a platform that you exchange cars with a neighbor, it's the supply which is hard to get. So convincing the guy to put their car, his car on the platform, so then you need to subsidize to make it easy for the supply. But then you have a, other example like freelancer platform, there the demand comes first. As soon as you convince the demand, the supply will jump on it. So it depends which side you need to uh, encourage to and subsidize with discounts and so on. 
And the third thing, which is really important, is about liquidity. So you have to learn that the platform aims the need to aim for liquidity, which is, uh, trans which is increasing the number of transactions, uh, capturing data, and generating the network effect. So not monetization. Okay, this is called the non-linear growth that we, we were discussing with the colleagues of Business Finland before. And just to give an idea, what uh, you are you are used to the the, the the traditional companies grow in this way, the red line. It's called the linear growth. Platform companies they grow in different ways. They grow in green or in blue. So I like to use the hockey stick example, which is the blue. So it just takes them a bloody long time to get them successful. But when they reach this pivotal point, then whew, So that begs the question of using the right uh, uh, metrics and KPIs to measure the success of platform companies which are different than, than the linear model. Okay? I leave you with the, what I think is the best, in my opinion, the best example ever, ever invented of a platform. It's this one. <laughs> uh, I, you, I don't put a pizza to reveal my nationality because it's clear from my accent, but uh, I think that the, the pizza economy, it, there's a lot of similarities between pizza and platforms, all right? First, the basic, the fundamentals in the pizza economy are the same as in the platform economy. So you have a, a dough shaped as a disc with fresh mozzarella, tomatoes, and three leaves of basil. So the basic of the platform that I showed you before, the triangle, right, in the diagrams, you remember, it's the same, the basic. Second, the pizza economy is an open source kind of thing because it allows a lot of independent producers to make toppings. So you have meat, you have fish, you have uh, pineapple, you have salmiaki in Finland. <laughs> it's disgusting, but it exists. <laughs> but, so you sure you have, sorry? Are you sure you're Italian? Uh, <laughs> I like some, yeah. Um, and the third thing, which is very important, is uh, the pizza economy allows big multinationals to try and test the platform economy risk-free. Do you know the history of uh, Domino's Pizza? They actually started by selling sandwiches, and they were making competition. They wanted to make competition to McDonald's, right, in the 60s. But then they went into this pizza business later on, and they started with the careers and so on. So this is an example that everybody could create a platform, even a large company. Um, thank you so much. This is the end. Um, if you want to dig deeper into platform development, or what I call platform mania these days, you can sign up to our workshops. We address uh, several phases of uh, platform development, from design to third-party integrations, to, to, to policies, to funding, to internationalization, to the blockchain. So there is something for everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Torregrosso. I'm CEO of Euro Freelancer, which is a, um, a curated platform for consulting and legal services on demand. And I'm former Secretary General, now board member of the European Sharing Economy Coalition. And in that framework, I've been doing governmental affairs for platforms. Um, I've been doing it for Uber, for Airbnb, and for eBay. So I've been working for this company. And uh, that's the end. I, I hope to get some questions.